Out of kindness, we listen to the body. And with wisdom, we understand that the body's not going to be perfectly comfortable. But still, it does matter. We do the best we can, listening, responding out of kindness. But then in the end, we accept the way it is because to not accept how it is is to be in a way at war with the body. Doesn't help anybody, doesn't help the body, doesn't help the mind settle. Body gets to be nature. And really the only thing that makes sense at this point, given that the body's like this right now for each of us, is just to do our best to harmonize with the body. And sometimes at the beginning of a sitting period, it can be a more obvious yes to the body where we breathe in more deep and satisfying, full, relaxed breath. Breathe out a full, satisfying exhalation. Kind of self-soothing for the body. At least we can give the body what it wants. It wants oxygen. So we take our time to fill, take our time to empty the lungs in a relaxed and full way. This simple way of telling the body I care. And just because the body isn't perfectly comfortable, I'm not going to take it personally, or I'm not going to hold it against the body because there's some discomfort. It would be as if we were to blame the weather for being the way the weather is. It only makes sense to care and love the body in the same way. It only makes sense to accept and work with the weather that we have each day. One of the most simple set of instructions I've ever heard came from Ajahn Amaro. Some of you might know him. He's a well-known Western monk in the Ajahn Chah lineage. He's now the abbot of Amaravati, a major monastery in England. And he said, Allow the body to find its natural ease as best you can. Allow the heart and mind to find its natural ease as best it can. And now stay alert being interested to whatever might arise to interrupt this ease of the body and the mind.
you might sense that this instruction requires at least a little faith that the body is capable of being at ease with conditions and the mind is capable of being at ease with the conditions and that we can actually be interested, not afraid of whatever arises to disturb or interrupt that ease. And whether we have clearly realized this or not, it's really useful to stay open to the possibility that there's something here and now that's stainless, empty of problems. not pushed around by these forces that come and go. Like the space of this room, the space of this moment is unaffected by what's happening. This points to some truth about the mind, about the nature of things. Whether or not we can sense open to that, and then all the noise, all the disturbance, everything that appears as a problem we can have a different relationship knowing that there are obscurations or disturbances Faith that these disturbances will cease on their own as soon as we stop feeding them to the process of identifying and getting attached, taking problems personally. So for the next five to 10 minutes, do your best to rely on some confidence that behind the noise, beyond the noise, surrounding the noise, there's a possibility of resting in this vast, empty of problem space here and now. The heart free of grasping. So 
So this trust then replaces the deep habit that I have to fix or get rid of or do something right. And instead we can practice trusting what's here. Trusting that everything ceases on its own. So whatever the activity is of the body and mind, just let that unfold. Sensing the silence, the space, the openness behind or all around. Maybe we don't have to postpone freedom.
deeply trusting the peace and ease, the sense of silent space, a heart unafflicted, Times the most helpful way to meditate, to practice, is to let go of all responsibilities for the qualities in the mind, skillful or not, and to simply trust the vast, peaceful, empty space of the present moment and learn how to keep that in mind. Just let nature, all the movement, just let it move there in the background. To learn how to let this vast, silent, peaceful space at the present moment, be in the foreground, really appreciate and trust and let it have its effect. Take a little time, adjust. And even as we're moving, 
being a human being with a body, with aches and pains or whatever. See if you can continue to sense that space, that peaceful space here and now. It's really the art of awakening is uh, how to live in a sense, how to live in two worlds, how to be connected to two worlds, be respectful of two worlds at the same time. One of those worlds is empty and silent and unstained and peaceful. And the other is this world of movement, of thought, the movement of sensation, of sound, of sight, of touch. And if that's the only world we know, right, then what happens is the way the mind understands that world of movement, the movement of body and mind, is with, is through attachment and identification. Because it's all we got, (laughs) in a sense. So we're going to hold on with our dear life Pleasant or unpleasant, doesn't matter, it's, it's what I got. <laughs> this thought, this sound, this touch, this experience. And we're so busy managing this ordinary world of sen- sensuality, sense experience, trying to make it pleasant, trying to avoid the unpleasant bits and endlessly thinking about it, that it never occurs to the mind unless we get instructions from someone wise like the Buddha. It never occurs to us that we're missing part of the picture. It's like half of the picture. And because of missing half of the picture, the relationship to the half we are sensitive to is really out of balance with greed, hatred, and delusion. One of the famous lines from the Dhammapada, no grip like greed, no, no burning like greed, no grip like hate, no net like delusion. You know, so this is real oppression, real suffering, and it arises because of our habit of misperceiving, and we're misperceiving because the mind, the heart doesn't have the whole picture. We're ignorant. We're focused on what we already know. And when we suffer, which we do, we fixate more intensely on what we already are seeing, already experiencing. So always the medicine we take to address the disease reinforces the problem, right? Like that's the, for those who know their some of the important discourses. That's the second dart or the second arrow discourse, famous teaching from the Buddha. And he talks about how, you know, being a human being with this limited understanding where the sensitivity is directed toward sensuality, sense experience, and then Unavoidably, we notice that we're not in control. We're vulnerable to unpleasant experiences, unpleasant thoughts, emotions, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touches. And we don't know what to do with that exposure to the unpleasantness of being human. 
So we put all this psychic weight on sense pleasure as a way to modify the sense of being exposed to sense pain, unpleasure, uh, unpleasurable experiences. So first we don't know what to do with uh, the unpleasant aspects of being human. <clears throat> that distorts our relationship to the ordinary pleasures that come to some degree at least with human life, depending on our particular circumstances because we're in a unhelpful, unworkable way. We're trying to use the ordinary but ephemeral pleasures like having a good meal or hanging out with good friends or even having a good sit to some degree, getting a little tranquility. But we're using these things to take the edge off of all the unpleasantness. But we're dependent on getting some hit of pleasure. So we try, like I did this afternoon, a little chilled ice tea. It was nice, but didn't last very long, you know. Try sitting this way and that way, turn the fan on, you know telling myself I can't look at the news. So there are a few things I let myself check, like my email <laughs> obsessively. <laughs> doesn't believe me, that doesn't bring pleasure, but it always seems like, you know, it's like at least uh, a way to distract the mind from what might temporarily feel unpleasant. And because of the skewed relationship with pleasure, thinking that it's going to liberate us from the unavoidable, unpleasant uh, events in life, experiences in life, then we more and more ignore neutral because it's not, it's neither a threat, it's unpleasant, nor is it what we imagine is a solution, the pleasure. So we cultivate this diluted, distorted tendency to ignore what's neutral, which just so happens to be most of our life. So we're more and more disconnected, which is itself unpleasant, which makes us more dependent on pleasure, right? And then because of our dependence on pleasure, we start having moral lapses. They won't notice if I take this you know, whatever it is, someone left something out, we'll take it. <laughs> or just different ways that we, you know, start making mistakes that have consequences, doing things that are unskillful because we're so desperate to get away from the unpleasant, so desperate to have a sense treat, so oblivious to what's neutral. We start missing the sort of moral roadmap that says, don't go here, don't do that, don't say that, you'll be sorry, because we're so in the throes of this relationship, this out of balance relationship with feeling tone, pleasure, unpleasantness, neutrality. And the Buddha describes this, as I'm sure a lot of you know, as these, it's a really, for me, could easily be turned into a horror, horror film. Um, but the image he uses are these enveloping vines and uh, the plants that can grow on the branches of tropical trees because there's enough humidity and nutriment there. Eventually, they drop their roots to the ground from the branches of these big tropical trees. And over probably decades, they completely envelop these big trees. And they can, this single vine can, you know, I think even several city blocks, some of these trees in tropical forests are um, just enveloping 
the pre-existing forest. (laughs) Isn't that a provocative image for like what this basic misperception is? And again, like uh, the way to hold conceptually this misconception, uh, one, you know, the Buddha brings it up in lots of different ways, different times during his 45 years of teaching in Northern India back 2,500 years ago. And one of the easy ways to understand it, this simile he used is actually expressed by a lay person um, and some monks evidently were arguing about like, what is the problem with our human life? Is it that we're sensitive? And it's just unworkable being a sensitive human being. And so that was like half of the people were making that argument. The other half were saying, no, it's not so much the sensitivity. It's that we're living a life. We're in a place, a time where what we're sensitive to is really unpleasant. So they were going back and forth. You know, is it that we're sensitive or that we don't have the right sense experiences? And eventually they asked this lay person, Chitta, who was respected as a really good student of the Buddha. And he said, he gave him the simile of their two big ox yoked together with that wooden thing, driving, pulling some cart. And he said, would it be right to say that the ox on the right is a fetter, a burden to the one on the left, or the one on the left is a burden to the one on the right? And the monks there said, no, that, that neither one is a burden on the other. The, the problem is that they're tied together with this yoke. So that was the image he used. And you can think of the two ox as sensitivity and what the knowing mind, the sensitive heart is sensitive to. So you could even say like, in some ways we talk about Dharma, all the movement of body and mind. And that's one of the meanings of Dhamma, like these different phenomena, things that show up, thoughts, emotions, sights, sounds, touches, and that there is this sensitive heart knowing mind that knows the movement of sound, the movement of sight, the movement of thought. So Buddha, the knowing, that Buddha in the sense of being awake, being open, being sensitive, Dhamma, all that's moving, all that's in motion. So what's the problem? (laughs) It's always a good, as a practitioner, neither optimistic nor pessimistic, right? So when we can get to that balanced place, we are realistic. And in that place of being grounded and realistic, in any moment, we can basically ask that question. So what exactly is the problem? Because as Shelley talked about uh, today and yesterday, you know, it certainly can feel like there's a problem. It's not easy being on retreat, at least in moments. Now, maybe there's an exception of one or two, three of you just having a grand old time thus far. (laughs) We'll see as things unfold. But, you know, we tend to cycle through heaven and hell on retreat. It's not just hell, but it's, you know, at least half of the journey, these cycling depending, it's not the same for everyone. So it isn't easy. So what's the problem? What? Because there is a sensitivity and there is a stuff, these endless phenomena, endless sense impingements, movement of sound, sight, touch, smell, taste, thought, and the knowing of it. So why is that a problem? And so this layperson Chitta says the problem is that something arises in conjunction with sensitivity and phenomena that sensitivity is sensitive to. And you 
You could call that, which arises in conjunction, you could call it ignorance or delusion, or greed, hatred, and delusion, or craving. And this arising arises because of not understanding things as they are. Not understanding that there's sensitivity and that there are phenomena that sensitivity is sensitive to. So even though it can seem extremely simplistic and even infuriating at times, just because we say it so often, you know, this is being known, this is the objects, the experiences, the phenomena, the sights, the sounds, the smells, the thoughts, is being known. We're pointing to that possibility that this can be really simple. This is being known, or this is being known. And it's, and when something does, as it almost always does, when something arises in conjunction, there's some attachment or dismissing of what's neutral or hating what's unpleasant or liking what's pleasant. If something arises in conjunction, then in that mind moment, it's something being known. That's the key. Because it's not about some trick, you know, where I stop something arising in conjunction with sensitivity and what the heart's sensitive to. It's about a shift in understanding. And the shift is, it is ever always something being known. It always appears that something is being known and I don't like it, or I like it, or I don't care about it because it's neutral. But it's never that. It's always an experience being known. It's never more complicated than that. So that's the practice. That's the freedom, the fruit of practice. And so there's an alignment between the way we practice and the freedom that's experienced because of practice. Right? We're, we're interested in those <laughs> two ox. Do you say oxen? I always forget. Oxen? Yeah, so two oxen. And they can, they're clearly related but they don't have to be bound, dependent, oppressing each other. They don't have to create that. That's the mistake. We think because of sensitivity or because of there are experiences that we're sensitive to, that there has to be a personal problem. We're so convinced of that. That habit is as deep as anything. But it's just that habit is just the next thing being known. And that's the trick. And all the hindrances, that's sort of what I thought I would share in, in tomorrow morning's instructions, maybe in the afternoon too. You know, we'll look at, you know, going back to that instruction from, that I got from Ajahn Amaro, doing our best to let the body find its natural ease. And you can bring this up all day long encouraging the heart to find, to trust its natural ease, that sense of space, unafflicted space, silent, empty, stainless, you know, whatever image for you is helpful. Let the body, right? we know we've touched in moments that body that doesn't have a problem with what's happening We've hopefully touched, tasted the mind, the heart that isn't having a problem. So we, we invite, we evoke that sense of ease. And as I think I mentioned in the guided instructions this evening, that's a real step of faith. Like is our, do we have faith that basically the world is out to get me? Is that what we have confidence in, the world, whatever it is, is somehow mean and is out to F with us. And that's the world we live in. Because if that's our 
conscious or unconscious belief, then of course we're, go we're going to want to build an edifice to protect ourselves. Like how can I build a moat with alligators or some fortress around myself because I think, whether I admit it out loud to myself or not, that stuff is out to get me. And it certainly feels that way when we're taking circumstance, conditions, weather, even our own thoughts personally, it certainly seems at times that they're really out to mess with us, harass us, intimidate us, crush us. So then, you know, we just do what animals do. We fight back, we hide, we beat our breast and lament and scream and wail. You know, that's what we do when we're overwhelmed and oppressed. And, and then if we have the good fortune and the support, then we might actually be curious. And the Buddha says in one of the suttas, and ask, does anybody know anything about this human predicament, suffering and the end of suffering? And if we do that sincerely, we might be fortunate enough to bump into some wise teachings that says, yeah, there's sensitivity and there's experience that we're sensitive to. And there's a wrong understanding that arises in conjunction with that. And you have to develop this confidence. You have to check it out. You have to borrow confidence initially that it's ever always something being known. Oh, this is being known, or this is being felt. However personal any moment, any experience is, practice using that frame. This is being felt. And then you react like you flinch. It's way, no, no, this is way too much. This is too intense. Is serious. Okay, it's serious. You still can do, Mark, whatever you need to do to take care of yourself, but it's something being known. So even as you're running for the hills or whatever you're going to do to deal with the problem that you're experiencing that you, you know, that is front and center, our top priority is to practice. But it doesn't prevent you from going to the hospital or speaking truth to power, or whatever you're going to do in the moment. But wisdom is doing its job. The practitioner, the spiritual practitioner, is doing his job, her job, its job, their job, which is, this is being known. And there's something which we don't like in that. There's a flavor to that. You could call it equanimity. You could call it the flavor, the heart flavor that is empty of self-importance, of self-drama, which is why it kind of rubs us the wrong way. Because this is the thing I said earlier, I, I heard from Joseph Goldstein, you know, the, the basic problem with desire or any of these sort of hindering tendencies is that the medicine we seek is the cause of the problem, right? So when we're feeling afflicted by desire, it just makes so much sense that if I just quench that desire, I'll be okay. But it's, that's how we got to that place to begin with, thinking that quenching desire leads to the going away of desiring. But clearly it doesn't. Or getting away from danger leads to feeling free from danger. It doesn't. It just leads to the more and more the rat race, being pushed around by feeling time, by liking what's pleasant and disliking what's unpleasant and ignoring what's neutral. And because sense experience never cease, This, this endless oppressive dance continues. So that's that second instruction. You know, we've been giving you these four instructions 
the first, you know, however you can say this with real confidence, whatever this is about, whatever is really important to me, I'm pretty sure getting tight isn't going to help. So I think it's okay to relax. It's stabilizing to relax. It's clarifying to relax. It's just so much increases the probability of being skillful when we're relaxed because we're able to feel and sense more. We're able to connect. And our response to the moment will be wiser because when we're tight, Tightness only leads to disconnection. That's the basic primitive move is that I flinch, I tighten, and it's this, it's kind of like creating some distance. Imagine really, you know, we can't really get distant. Putting our head in the sand. Was it, I think Crystal looked it up. (laughs) Ostriches don't put their heads in the sand. They've had a bad rap for a while. Yeah, so the, we have to really be respectful and appreciate that, the depth of that habit, you know. So whenever we're experiencing something that's unpleasant, mildly or intensely, or pleasurable, some fantasy or whatever, mildly or intensely pleasurable or neutral experience, nothing's happening. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, half a, four and a half days left, nothing's happening. I mean, neutrality can be as scary as unpleasantness for sure. And then interestingly, even pleasure can be a little bit hard to bear. You know, it's just like too much. We just, we even want some distance from pleasure. Do you notice that we, in a very similar way to when it's difficult, we get tight when it's really pleasurable? You know, we don't just, rarely when it's pleasurable, I mean, when we train ourselves, we can get better at this. Like just, but, but there's a grip, like wanting it to last grip or immediately like, there's a great poem by Basho, a Japanese poet. Even, this is, I might mess it up, mess it up a little bit. Even while in Kyoto, I long for Kyoto, you know, evidently a beautiful city in uh, Japan. Even while in Kyoto, I long for Kyoto when I hear the cuckoo cry, right? So it's like, you're here on retreat and you notice something beautiful about the building or about the surrounding land. And we're on retreat. I I, I noticed this earlier today when I was walking the loop, I was right about there. And I I just had an out loud laugh. It was just so funny. I was here in a beautiful place. I really like walking around the field. It's always pleasurable. And I was thinking about being in a nice place, wanting to be in a nice place on retreat. And then it, well, I mean, I'm, I know I'm leading the retreat. I'm not exactly on retreat, but in that moment, I didn't have to do any work, right? I didn't have to plan a talk or I was just on retreat really. And there I was fantasizing about being on retreat. And that's the suffering of pleasure having what I want, triggering, wanting what I have, right? Because the mind doesn't know that there can be sensitivity and something being sensitive that we're sensitive to, but it means letting go of ownership. That's the yoke that's strong. You know, we talk about anatta, the sense of self, permanent, fixture in our mind, self-view, that's what has to go away. Not the sensitivity, not the engagement, the exposure, the richness of pleasure and pain and 
all that unfolds in our lives, but the wrong understanding of it. And so, in any moment, it doesn't matter how many moments we missed, at any moment we can come back to just hitting that same note over and over again. And that same note is, like, how simple can this be? Realistically, how simple can this be? Well, this moment, this subjective moment of my life, in its essence, is just something being known. Can I live with that profound simplicity? Can I learn to trust it and see what it leads to? And then the confidence really begins to build. We see how peaceful that is. We see the amazing power that has to dissolve the edifices of our problems when we keep returning to that truth. But we like in our, the edifices of our problems because it, it, it comes with that self-importance. And we just have to decide, you know, are we ready to let go of that addiction to self-importance and let things become radically simple? And that's really up to us. Nobody can do that for us, you know. That's why sometimes it's useful to think about it in terms of a really wholesome exhaustion really exhausted about anything that has the flavor of self-importance. And then the alternative isn't to hate ourselves for being addicted to self-importance or to try to think our way to the absence of self-importance. The way back or the way out is just to align with the Buddha's teaching and practice, which is it's just something being known. Just keep hitting that same note, keep aligning with that way of being. This is being known, this is being felt. And any doubt, any of the hindrances that show up, like this can't be right, okay, that's just a thought, it's totally fine, and it's something being known. And if there's a emotional flavor to it, that's just that feeling being known. And if we start feeling some peace and some ease and some well-being, we might start building castles in the sky because life, no, I don't feel so oppressed. And so, you know, we can imagine all kinds of fantasies. And then we just, you know, we don't, popping that bubble is not aggressive at all. <clears throat> We're just seeing whatever inflated bubble the mind created fantasy about becoming, doing, whatever. We're just seeing it for what it is. We're not aggressively popping it. We're just, if that's just a thought and feeling, being known and felt. It's not more or less than that. And on and on like that. And I know it can get at times really dry. It can, there, there are always going to be certain thoughts that uh, grab us. Like, yeah, I really believe what Mark or the Buddha said, but it's just not working for me. I must not have understood it completely. And then we, we don't practice with that reaction or that thought. And that's always the issue that something arises, there's a dhamma, right? There's a phenomena, a thought, an emotion, an experience, and we forget to do the practice, which is to simply understand this is being felt, this is being known. And always forever reducing or deconstructing or coming to that basic. And the thing is, there's no way to argue with that. It is true. Something is being known. And there's not anything more that needs to be said, like in terms of instruction, actually. It just seems, you know, the Buddha talked for 45 years, ran into a lot of people each time, you know, and so there's 
lots of talks and points, but it really comes down to this image. Can there be sensitivity and the richness of the human experience given all of our baggage and trauma? And so that makes, like when we have an experience, so much comes forward, right? We see an attractive person. It's amazing how much comes forward. Like everything, you know, that spectrum, everything from shame to this could fix my life to whatever. Sex is bad, <laughs> sex is good. You know, it's like, it's amazing how just one experience or something that brings up that sense of not being good enough. That could be so rich. And if we can just remember to play, well, maybe it's just something being known, something being felt. So let's leave it here. Just take a few seconds, let the words go. listening everyone. So we have about uh, 30 minutes for some